Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Today we've got a lot of crazy stories, including one where OP gets an entire group of people deported. That said, our first story of the day is revenge against my crazy cat lady girlfriend. My girlfriend was a cat lady. She wasn't a lady in the way that she had dozens of cats and she was living alone. Instead, she was obsessed with one cat, her cat. She had an expensive pedigree cat that was the center of her universe. Every part of her life revolved around it. My girlfriend came for money, which is how she was able to get the cat in the first place. It was a gift for her 18th birthday from her father. She had put that cat through grooming and training schools so that she could enter it into pedigree competitions. Her entire social standing was based around her cat. I of course didn't know this when we first started dating. We were introduced through some mutual friends and sort of got into a rhythm and found ourselves living together. I didn't come for money, but I worked hard. I went to college and got a job. The only thing that I had in my life that one would call an expensive thing was a car that I inherited from my father. It was a vintage hot rod that he got from his dad. I loved that car. Most of the money I made went into our apartment and the business that I was trying to build. Most of the money she got from her parents went into traveling to different cat shows around the country. She didn't even have a job, even though she graduated from a very prestigious university. She was basically living off her trust fund. Of the two things I didn't understand about her, the one that confused me the most was the fact that she hated spending her own money. She was always borrowing money from me or our friends, and rarely did she ever pay for things when we went out. The second thing is that she never won. Someone always beat her. Someone's cat was either better groomed, better trained, or of a better pedigree. And she was forever sending the cat to schools and parlors. The cat didn't live with us because she wanted to have the best care possible, so the cat had its own apartment where there were people taking care of it. We would visit the cat every day, and on the days where I couldn't make it, she got upset with me. I had just about had enough and was ready to break up with her when she did the most unspeakable thing I could ever imagine. She wanted to go overseas for a cat show but didn't feel like paying her way there. Instead, she sold my car for less than half of what it's worth and used that money to go to the competition and still not win. I didn't drive my car very often because it was a vintage car and I didn't know that it was sold for almost two weeks after the fact. I initially thought it was just stolen. And so when I told her, she just nonchalantly said, oh, she sold it. Her justification was that the car was just an object that was costing us money because I was paying for special parking, but that her cat was a living being. I knew that there was no way I was going to get my money back from her. And I also knew that there was no way I was getting my car back because anyone who'd buy that car for that price was never going to give it up. So I set about getting my money back from the person who robbed me of it. The first part was not complicated. I had access to the cat's apartment and I knew when the cat was alone. So one day during our regular visits to his royal feline majesty, I made sure that one of the apartment windows were open before we left. Now while all the stereotypes of pedigreed cats being snobs are true, cats are still cats. And this was being raised like an Olympic athlete. It was on a very strict diet designed to make sure that it never got fat and a bunch of other things I didn't understand about shiny coats. But I did pick up on a few things here and there after a few years of listening to my girlfriend prattle on and on. The point was that this cat was starved for real food. And so one night, I snuck over to the apartment and lured the cat out the window with a tin of tuna. I still had the storage space where my car used to be parked and that's where I kept the cat. The ransom note arrived before the cat's caretakers reported it missing. My girlfriend went from confusion to hysteria and a slow, steady decline of sanity. At first, she couldn't believe it because she didn't know her cat was missing. And often when she found the cat was gone, she did good and accepted. I saw a side to her I never knew. She was threatening all kinds of evil upon the person who took her cat if she ever found them. I was honestly scared and wondered if I'd done the smart thing by taking this cat. I knew I had to be extra cautious not to get caught. Under normal circumstances, I imagine she would have informed the police and done everything to catch whoever took her cat, but I made sure that she wouldn't. I kidnapped the cat two days before the biggest competition of the year. It was a local competition, and everyone she knew and respected was going to be there. 
so I knew she would do everything to get that cat back before anyone found out what happened. The ransom was for twice the amount of what my car was worth, and she paid it immediately. That night, the cat mysteriously found its way back to the apartment, but only after I'd done a few modifications on it. I discreetly shaved some of the cat hair and replaced it with dyed hair belonging to another cat. I also had a new certificate of pedigree forged for the cat. She entered her cat as usual, and all of her socialite friends were there. As soon as the competition began, I slipped a note with the forged certificate of pedigree to the judges. When the judges came to examine her cat, they immediately started looking for the hair that I replaced. These people are experts when it comes to cats, and they knew fake hair from real hair instantly. They then produced the forged certificate that I gave them to show that my girlfriend's cat was actually not a pedigree cat. They accused her of shaving her cat and replacing the telltale spots of the hair from mixed breeding. She was shamed in front of everybody she respects and banned from competing in any other competitions nationally. She was also reported for cruelty to animals and fraud. Well, let's be real here. The cruelty to animals charge, I don't think that's going to stick because what cruelty did they do to this cat? Like, yeah, the cat might want some tuna, but I imagine the cat's in really good shape and by all means has probably had a very, very pampered life that honestly might have been treated better than most humans. I gotta say though, I'm usually pretty staunchly against doing anything involving people's pets. I'm a huge pet lover, but a person like this who can go turn around behind your back and sell your car off and then not even tell you about it and pocket the money, I don't feel too bad about what OP did here at all. Although I think we can all agree what OP did here was pretty crazy, do you think OP was justified or went too far in what they did? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from Noaleka. Coworkers all laughed at my assault, got them deported. I know it sounds bad and maybe I did overreact. I was 18 years old, had been kicked out of my mom's, and was living with my cheating, didn't know at the time, boyfriend while working three jobs to make ends meet. I had just started at this sushi chain in our small city when one of the chefs, middle-aged, offered to make me a roll. Even if it was comped, it still had to be entered into the point of sale system. I didn't know how and asked him to help. As he walked around me, he made a point of slowly, aggressively rubbing himself against my butt and entire backside in front of the kitchen crew who were all watching. I left the room to gather my composure. I felt so violated and embarrassed. After deciding to walk out, I went back in to grab my things from the cubby. I entered the room to find that every single one of them were eyeing me and laughing at me. It was cruel and humiliating. On the way home, I got pulled over for driving a bit erratically. I was extremely emotional, got a $900 ticket I absolutely could not afford. I was so absolutely infuriated with the chef and everyone there who laughed at me and delighted in schadenfreude at my assault. I guess now it's worth mentioning that they were all clearly immigrants. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but in my anger, I sent an anonymous tip to ICE. A few months later, I saw their Yelp reviews had tanked and all the recent ones were complaining that the entire kitchen had closed. Their kitchen crew were all gone, the waitresses were huddled behind the counter talking about lawyers, they didn't serve any hot food anymore, and eventually they shut down. An old coworker confirmed my suspicions were true as well. I'm not racist at all, I wanted revenge and took the cheapest route, I'll admit, but in my heart I still believed every one of them deserved it. The ticket was for speeding in a school zone, 33 and a 20 mile per hour. It wasn't a school, but rather a historic slash public park with a crossing light that fell into that category for traffic citations. Failure to yield to pedestrians. They'd barely reached the sidewalk and I didn't slow down. Yes, I was wrong. Driving without proof of registration and insurance. I had both, but had misplaced the registration and didn't know the login info to the insurance app. This all got thrown out in court for a forgiveness law slash program they had for young drivers. The manager who I reported this to after I left got charged by the restaurant for embezzling $10,000 and was fired after this. The owner tried not paying me for weeks until I threatened him with lawyers. Then a guy showed up and paid me in cash instead. 
I just think if you're in a country illegally and you're just trying to silently make it by, I think you try to keep your head down low and try not to make yourself a target in any way. I think the only way OP or anybody should feel remotely bad for any of these people in this situation is if some amount of people got impacted that didn't laugh at OP or didn't think it was funny. But from all accounts, what OP expressed here, it seems like pretty much all of them were on the laughing side making light of the fact that OP very legitimately got assaulted. Not only was OP effective in getting revenge, they were effective in making sure that these people all definitely kept plenty of distance from OP after the fact, not going to be able to harass or laugh or bother OP at all now that they're in a different country. The second these guys stopped laying low and drew any amount of attention to themselves, they were putting their safety on the line. This next story is from David E. Mag X. Your bully son messes with us and you kill our dog? Prepare for dad. This happened in 1995 in a small rural town in Chaco province, Argentina. Everybody knows each other here until this very day. My father was an electrician, the only one in town, so he was constantly meeting people, and as he was born and raised here, he was very well known by everyone. He grew up with many of the police officers from back then, and even had asados together, Argentinian barbecue, at least three times a month for years. My father was not a violent man, that was the only time I saw him do something like that. The other man, with his busy son, they were not from town. They had moved here a year or so prior, they were from Buenos Aires. I didn't really know the guy, only his kid, who was an absolute butt hat to almost every kid in the block, and he constantly picked on me and my brother since we were the youngest of our neighborhood, therefore couldn't defend ourselves. Our dog Bucky wasn't trained since we didn't know about training, but he was loyal and playful with every kid. One thing's for sure though, he was protective. One afternoon we were playing in the park, and out came the bully kid who at first threw rocks at us, then he got closer and started calling us names, and us, being little, got scared. He was bigger than us. We tried to leave, but he blocked us and started hitting my brother. I tried to stop him, but he did the same to me. Bucky heard us crying and came running jumping and getting the bully's arm at once. He bit, shook, and released, staying between us and the bully, barking like mad until the kid left running. We saw him get inside his house, and a few seconds later came his father with a sledgehammer. Bucky stood in front of us, hairs raised and barking, but the man didn't stop. He got close, raised the sledgehammer, and didn't do it once. He hit him five times. The first blow I'll never forget. The painful whimper of our dog, Bucky got knocked with the first blow. My brother and I were frozen in place, scared to death, crying a lot. The jerk dad said something which I don't remember now and left. We were unable to move for a moment. Such was our fear. Finally, I grabbed my brother and went home. Dad was fixing a fan when he saw us and asked what happened. We told him and he just said, right, okay, let's wash your faces and grab some ice cream. Yeah, that's what our dad did. Took us for ice cream. He did a pretty good job to mask his emotions and showed himself cheerful to us. That night when brother was asleep and I was playing in the kitchen, he grabbed the wrench, told mom and I he had to fix something over at the neighbors. I assumed it was another neighbor since it was a common thing for my dad to get asked by neighbors to fix things. Nodded to mom, mom nodded back, yes she knew, and left. He came back some minutes later, told me to go to bed, and that was it. A decade later, we came to know what happened. He went to the guy's house, knocked on the door, and punched the dude so hard it rocked his head back. He told him he would break one limb for each of his children, whom he made cry. I can only imagine what he would have done if there were more than two kids. Proceeded to beat the guy some more in front of his family, and then took the wrench and broke his legs. He then left the house, went home, asked me to go to bed, talked to mom and went straight to the police, turned himself in, and was actually delayed until the police went and checked with the other guy. My dad also showed our dead dog to them and the police found the sledgehammer in the bully's house with blood still on it and they let my father go. They also spoke with the dude when he got better and suggested him to leave the town if they weren't liked before, they would never be now. To this, you gotta understand the mindset from some small rural towns. We looked at outsiders with mistrust back then, and it took a while for people to get used to you if you were new in town. However, these people came and weren't very much liked. 
apparently because of the kid, and the father was also a jerk. I don't condone the actions of my father, nor am I justifying in any way the events that transpired then, but as a father myself, I can totally understand to what extent a man can react when their kids are at play. I loved my dad, and I have mad respect for him. Rest in peace, dad, we miss you greatly. Like I said earlier, I am a staunch pet lover. This story honestly broke my heart and there were extra details about the sledgehammer and whatnot that I just didn't feel comfortable reading and had to skip over. Like I know in that dad situation they saw a dog that bit their kid, but even then I couldn't ever imagine doing that to an animal. I really genuinely think you've got to be a absolutely cold hearted sadistic person to be able to go and do something like that especially in front of some kids. And personally, I agree a lot with what OP said here. I wouldn't condone what the father did, but like, considering it's your kids and also your dog, I get it and I get why. For somebody who went and did that to a dog that was only looking out for their humans, I have absolutely no remorse for any of that. And our final story of the day is from our ad 8095, my school actually protected me even though I was harassed outside the school premises. This occurred over a decade ago. It happened at the end of my senior year of high school. I'm from India and girls are still afraid to tell others about being harassed because of shame and society. I was enrolled in a big school. There were almost more than 800 students at my school. So you can imagine the rush and crowd while leaving the school. It used to get so crowded and chaotic because there were parents' cars and auto rickshaws waiting to pick up the kids. Some kids were riding their bicycles through the crowd, while others were run to the nearby vendors for penny puri and samosas. It's almost like an amusement park. One day, while walking hand in hand with my friend, I spotted this weird straggling man looking through the bunch of kids. I thought he might be looking for someone specific and didn't think much about it, but I must admit he was creepy. I saw him again a few more times daily, but one day when I was walking with my friend, making our way through the crowd, that man crossed me. I was about to collide with him and tried to avoid him, but instead he pushed me and grabbed and pinched my chest area so hard that it began to hurt a lot. He was so smooth with his actions that my friend, who was by my side, couldn't tell what happened. She kept asking me what was wrong, but I just walked mindlessly to my auto rickshaw and sat there and told her to go away. She understood and walked away, as she used to live nearby. I was so shaken that when I got home and saw my parents, I burst into tears. Because I'm the only child, I was never afraid to tell my parents anything. And I told them everything. My dad was pissed. And that's where our revenge started. I've never seen my dad so angry before. He drafted a plan to trap the sleaze ball with his friends. We'll name them Uncle One and Uncle Two. My dad was friends with our school principal. He visited them when I was attending my school the next day, as if nothing had happened, as they told me not to tell anyone. Our principal was great and assured us that even though it happened outside the school, they would fully cooperate to trap the sleaze ball. At lunch, they called me into the principal's office and told me that Uncle One and Uncle Two would be scattered in the crowd with my English teacher. The school gatekeeper will be near me and my dad will be near the shop where I usually spot the man. They instructed me to walk normally with my friend and avoid them as if they were strangers. But to alert the nearest person, as soon as I spotted the sleaze ball, my dad and others were there the whole day, and at 5 p.m. it was time to execute the plan. As I was instructed, I was walking casually with my friend. She asked me several times because she knew something was odd, but I told her to shush and enjoy the show. And then I spot the sleaze ball actually harassing my other classmate, and I quickly alerted Uncle One. Initially, it was planned not to hit him and just call the police, but he was caught in the act. So Uncle One dragged him away and started beating him. Soon, my dad, Uncle Two, and the gatekeeper joined him. Then my English teacher handled the situation and dragged the sleaze ball inside the school gates and into the principal's office. My classmates surrounded me with questions, and I gladly answered them and stayed outside the gates with them. After a few minutes, I was called into the principal's office, where I saw the sleaze ball. I thought they might ask me some questions, but the principal gave me some apple juice and told me to relax. Sleaze ball was there crying, begging to let him go as he would never do it again. He was badly bruised and his clothes were torn. 
After a few minutes, the police came and took the sleaze ball, and he was giving me such a deadly look that it still gives me the chills. My father and everyone else in the room were so happy and smiling as if there was a celebration and told me that they were so proud of me as I'd saved multiple girls that day. I still don't know the details, but the school took full responsibility for our safety, put that man into jail, and CCTVs were installed within a week, even in a parking lot to cover the area outside the school. Honestly, it's really disappointing to hear about creepers being able to get away with stuff for so long in these kinds of areas, but in a place like India where everything is so hustling and bustling and really kind of madness in the streets as school lets out, you kind of sadly see where some of these creeps can just slip through the cracks like that. Especially preying on kids who don't know any better and they might be shy or uncomfortable mentioning something that happened. I don't feel one bit of remorse over this dude getting beat up over preying on kids like that. And not only honestly was this guy asking for it, but they kept showing up to the same spot and harassing the same people. This dude was bound to get thrashed at some point, right? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another revenge story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.